Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the editor in chief of Current Affairs magazine. I am joined today by Kyle Chaker. He is a staff writer at The New Yorker. He is the author of the book we're here to talk about today, The Longing for Less, Living with Minimalism. And perhaps most important about Kyle Chaker, he once wrote an article in which the opening sentence was, Nathan Robinson is gesticulating, which is one of my (laughs) favorite things that has ever been written about me before and is true. And I didn't notice how much I gesticulated until it was pointed out in that article uh, about current affairs and other left-wing publications for The Ringer in 2017. Kyle Checker, thank you so much for joining us on Current Affairs today. I'm glad we could reunite after all of these years. Many years. <laughs> uh, many, many years. You saw Current Affairs, and you very kindly covered Current Affairs in our earliest days when we were a uh, an operation based out of my living room. Now we're serious, professional, national magazine. So it's nice to reconnect. We haven't seen each other since then. But we're here today to talk about minimalism. Now, one of the blurbs on your book says that Carl Jager in The Longing for Less peels back the commodified husk of minimalism to reveal something surprising and thoroughly alive. Before we get to the thing you reveal that is surprising and thoroughly alive, let's talk about the commodified husk. What are they referring to there? Yeah, I mean, I think the commodified husk at the time that I wrote the book, which was circa 2018, 2019, Mm. was the specter of Mary Kondo. Like, I was definitely responding to that moment of her total media saturation, which was, like, the Netflix show, the books were everywhere. This was also kind of peak Instagram-era aesthetics, I feel. So this idea of minimalism was completely everywhere. And, you know, from the Mary Kondo perspective, it meant this idea of cleaning out your house and getting rid of all of your stuff. You know, I never saw her show, so I saw the moment, and I didn't like the sound of her project to the extent that I understood it. She had some things to say about books and not keeping too many books. Now, I, as a person who is surrounded, (laughs) getting rid of not many. You could have like forty books. Forty. I think it was forty. That's what I remember. It could have been less, but I mean, you know, I probably have three hundred books around here. I'm surrounded by books to the point that they represent a safety hazard. There are sort of towers of unstable books all over the current affairs offices. I always wondered, though, whether I resented her to the extent I understood her for reasons that were rational, or whether what I didn't like was that she was pointing out something that was true. What did you feel? I think she hit a nerve. Like, the books wouldn't have sold so much. She wouldn't have been so popular if there wasn't some element of truth to what she was saying. I mean, by all of her press coverage accounts, she was way more popular in the United States than she was in Japan. So there was this image of, like, a very austere Japanese woman coming from this kind of, like, cliche East Asian spirituality background who is telling you that you didn't need all of the consumerist crap in your house. And there's something deeply appealing about that and kind of almost archetypal or cliche. And I think Americans in that moment, we were coming out of this phase of peak internet consumption, maybe like everything felt new online at that time, circa like 2016 to 2019. Direct-to-consumer products were everywhere. Instagram advertising was everywhere. You could suddenly buy anything you wanted to buy online. And I think that caused a kind of hangover after a few years that everyone just suddenly realized they were addicted to getting stuff on Amazon and then looked around and saw their full apartments and houses and wondered what the fuck they're doing and what to do with all this stuff. Why wasn't she popular in Japan? I think because there was an overflow, like that market was already served in Japan. She was a professional cleaner who was trained in a particular kind of cleaning in Japan already. And so I think there was already this wider class of people and, and a genre of books about tidying up. And so I think she wasn't as unique in that space. Now, to the extent the minimalism of the period that you are discussing here, 
just a general kind of belief that maybe we order too many things on Amazon and we should be a little more thoughtful about what we buy and why we're buying it and whether it is in fact bringing us any joy or was there something more to (laughs) it like you know an aesthetic of its own a certain prescribed lifestyle tell us a little bit more about kind of what this was and is i think it was this kind of movement or lifestyle idea like it did go far beyond mary kondo there was a bunch of american bloggers as well who were talking about minimalism talking about living with less and kind of getting out of the consumerist mindset. And I think that kind of lifestyle minimalism merged and bled into the aesthetic of minimalism that had also become more popular. And the kind of aesthetic of minimalism and the artistic heritage of it stretches back to the 1960s, which we can talk about. But I think in the 2010s, It was this native aesthetic to the internet, to the kind of like multimedia heavy internet where everything on Instagram looked very austere and minimalist. Clothing design from the kind of generic Everlane Uniqlo brands was very minimalist. Sneakers were minimalist. Makeup was minimalist. Furniture was minimalist. It was just kind of the trendy visual idiom of that time. And I think a lot of people were attracted by that for quite a while, but then also started to become repelled by it by kind of the late 2010s. Well, I have very mixed feelings about it, because on the one hand, I consider myself something of the embodiment of a maximalist in that you can't see here, but I am surrounded by what can only be described as tchotchkes from every part (laughs) of my life little old postcards and toys and artifacts and flags and old advertisements and books and magazines. And yet, for all of my maximalism, my love of intricate floral patterns and what have you, there is that anti-consumerist or and even pro-ecological, the sense that we consume too much and it's unsustainable and it's destroying the planet, Uh, that I think I sympathize with. Help me work through how I should feel about this. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's a weird paradox. I mean, the most ironic thing that I found about 2010's minimalism was this idea that you could buy more products, new products that were minimalist, and thus you would feel better about yourself. Like, you could buy the minimalist lamp, you could buy the minimalist t-shirt that you'd only need one of, And this was like more consumption, added consumption that gave you the veneer of somehow consuming less, probably through the aesthetic. So when I think about tchotchkes and kitsch and like antiques and stuff like that, it's all stuff that already exists. Like it's material and physical objects that have been circulating through humanity for years or decades already and building up a kind of patina that's not really minimalist, but it is like it has a history, it has a presence. It's not adding maybe to the environmental damage that manufacturing a new t shirt or ephemeral furniture or whatever is going to cause. So I do feel like there's that irony there that minimalism gives the aesthetic of consuming less, but you're actually consuming more new stuff. That's interesting because, the, well, thank you. You've exonerated me here because I would claim that. I have caused fewer new things to have to be brought into the world using its resources due to my consumption of uh, vintage and old of the old shit than some of these minimalists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the vintage, you know, I, I always think of the architecture fact that demolishing a building causes more environmental damage than like rehabbing the building that already exists. Like there's less damage and consequence in keeping what's already around you rather than buying new stuff, no matter how minimalist it is. Well, actually that's funny because in my hometown of Sarasota, Florida, every time I go back, another 1920s Florida house, I love these old houses, has been flattened and a giant white cube has emerged in its place, which is all of the fashion now. And if you go into (laughs) these houses, people have the polished concrete floors, they have very little furniture, but it's like there was already a house there. (laughs) 
Oh my god. <laughs> the polished concrete floors, like I have a lot of sympathy for the minimalist aesthetic. I love it. It's kind of my taste to begin with, but the cement floors is just beyond the pale for me. Like it's uncomfortable. It's so austere. It just seems completely absurd. And I do like that's totally this like the modern minimalism versus what it might have meant decades ago. Like the generic glass box that's like pre made and plopped onto anywhere in the United States is this like cliche now. It's not minimalist at all, really. I do have to say, there's also some stuff that, you know, minimalism kind of, well, again, it's not really one thing. So I don't want to be careful. I want to be careful about making like a uh, general statements, but I feel like there's a belief that kind of form follows function and minimalism is about stripping something down to its bare, you know, what do you need in order for it to function? But sometimes it's an illusion. And I think of the bathroom that I had in my previous apartment, which is very minimalist bathroom, pure white. First off, the white got dirty very, very fast. But second off, the shower, this beautiful shower with uh, just a one glass pane, no door. It just made a mess because there's no door. You minimalized, <laughs> you minimized so much that you minimized the door away, and it turned out you needed a door on that shower. Yeah, <laughs> the water just goes out. Like it looks yeah. beautiful, it doesn't fulfill the function that it's supposed mm-hmm. to do, and that's like breaking form follows function, right? Like the the function does not exist. It's all about that beautiful form of the single glass pane. And it's actually not efficient or functionalist in the slightest. You cite in your book the very amusing fact that when uh, Apple built its new headquarters, they put in these glass, these panes of glass, these walls of glass that were so, <laughs> so beautifully transparent that everyone bonked into them. Yes, and I think they had to put sticky notes Mm -hmm. on them so people didn't run into the glass walls. And that was just, you know, pure aesthetic over architectural function. And I think, I mean, this kind of vocabulary comes from modernist architecture, like Le Corbusier or Mies van der Rohe. And I think when you look back at their buildings from the 40s, 50s, 60s, whatever, they aren't so extreme as what we see now. Like, they aren't full of glass walls the bathrooms don't Mm. look like the the, your minimalist bathroom does i think they did have a functionalist purpose in mind originally but it's just become over time this hyper aestheticized style that people consume rather than thinking about the meaning or function behind things corbusier did want to flatten half of paris and put up these beautiful simple towers didn't he (laughs) It's true, yeah, the tower to park urbanism theory did not work out so well, I would say. But I do think, you know, his other great quote, the the house is a machine for living, has certainly turned out to be true and is what people look for now. They're just not very good machines for living, like like your minimalist bathroom. Well, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't want a machine for you living. The I want Warren, a uh, the cozy cave. glove I can slide into. A, co- a cocoon. <laughs> I want a cocoon out of my house. And I, but uh, no, I, I wanted that what we're touching on right now is sort of the idea that some minimalism can be an illusion. And you mention that... I think you mentioned Apple products in that they made these beautiful, simplified designs and you overlook all the kind of minimalism can hide the messy infrastructure that is necessary to make a lot of these consumer goods possible. For sure. Like the fact that Apple devices become flatter and thinner over time and just like infinitely flat and thin and wide, like the glass phone looks like nothing and yet you can't use it without all the infrastructure behind it. Like your, your device may look minimalist, I think, as I write in the book, but the whole mass of undersea cables and server farms and like aluminum mines and factories, that is not minimalist at all. That's all the infrastructure and mess that supports the illusion of your perfectly minimalist phone. And I think we don't think about that stuff enough because the design discourages us us from thinking about it. We don't think about the fact that there's a battery in the phone because we can't replace it. We don't interact with it. It's just this like pristine block of steel and glass. 
Well, it's, it's kind of ironic, isn't it? Because as I understand some of the tendencies in 20th century architecture, like one of the big demands was that things shouldn't be, that architecture at least should get more honest and kind of expose its innards. And there's the Pompidou Center, you know, where you can see what the building is because we don't want to lie to people. Yeah, I mean, I think part of minimalism and part of the artistic movement in the 60s, 70s was actually exposing the bare material of a thing. So whether that was like an architectural form or a steel box that Donald Judd made, it was about getting down to the actual material of a thing and kind of confronting the rawness of it in a very brutal way. Whereas the phone, the iPhone, I think, doesn't do that. It doesn't confront you with its materiality. It just helps you disappear into the digital world, I guess. Mm -hmm. And there are some ways out there in which, you know, by this desire to strip everything down to its essentials, we may lose some of the things that, you know, we think we're getting down to the essentials, but we're actually taking away things that gave us pleasure and delight and we didn't realize it. I kind of think of GeoCities websites and blogs versus Substack. Substack is very minimalist compared to a lot of old mm. web design, <laughs> which was messy and it was cluttered yes. and it was ugly. And Substack is sleek and it is beautiful, but it loses a certain kind of element of personality. Homogenizes, yes. Well, it totally homogenizes everyone's internet presence. Like, this is kind of the subject of my next book, but... So many of the digital platforms we use, like, one, are very minimalist. They follow this modernist idea of, like, empty white space and perfect geometric design. And they force everyone into using those same templates. So Substack kind of follows Medium, which was perfectly designed to be the perfect writing tool on the internet. And everyone's blog looks the same. <laughs> like, you can kind of choose which color you want and maybe choose a few different fonts. But on GeoCities, you could stick a random GIF of like a construction worker working on an in-progress sign wherever you wanted. You could build weird frames. You could add and subtract pages. So in some ways, I feel like the internet has become less messy and less personally creative. Even then, it was in 2011, 2012 with Tumblr, which was felt like it was more of a personal form of expression. It was customizable. You kind of designed your blog, your page to evoke your own personality and tastes. And now we just have a series of homogenous templates that we're forced into. Well, I mean, one of my problems with contemporary architecture has always been the loss of the filigree and the ornament, the stuff I love that's whimsical and totally unnecessary. You know, people have pointed out that kind of, uh, there are many areas in which aesthetics might have become slightly more boring over time. Cars, I don't know if this is illusion, but I've seen a lot of diagrams put together showing the convergence of car design, showing that all cars have started to look the same. Mm -hmm. And I do worry that you do get this homogenizing effect where everything has become clean and antiseptic and you've reached your perfect state of nothingness. And uh, where do you go from there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like asymptotically moving toward nothing, I think, for quite a few years in the 2010s, particularly. Like you can see that with cars, which all were more homogenous. And I think the same few colors are now more popular. You can see it with fashion brand logos, which all became these generic sans serif, like plain black text on white ground. You can see it with clothing, where it was this kind of semi preppy, minimalist blankness. And everything was kind of converging and coming together at this single, theoretically perfect point of taste. But then all of a sudden, it became insanely boring. Like, I think taste always is a pendulum swinging back and forth. And when there, we reach one extreme, we just automatically want to go to the total opposite. And we craved, like, noise and chaos and difference and diversity. And I feel like, I mean, the pandemic was coincidental timing perhaps but it definitely catalyzed everyone feeling very bored and over this minimalist aesthetic and the sameness because suddenly things were the same every day and for everyone so no one wants more of that 
you sense that there is a general shift in the zeitgeist since you began this book? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you, there's a bunch of articles already about kind of Gen Z maximalism and how, you know, the next generation prefers much more decor and filigree and chaos and like visual engagement. But then it's like, is that because of TikTok? Fuck like, yeah. Is that, is, is our Instagram <laughs> minimalism just becoming their TikTok maximalism and everything yeah. needs to like move and ooze and stretch and be blobby and weird? <laughs> like my theory has always been that digital platforms cause homogenization, like everyone being on the same Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, whatever homogenizes so many things. And so I think the homogeneity might stay the same, even if the style is changing. Like we move from generic Instagram minimalism to generic TikTok, Uzi, bright color maximalism. I wanted to just put a word to you and ask you how it relates and plugs in mm. to your thinking about minimalism. That word is utilitarian. Do you think minimalism tends to be utilitarian? I think so. I mean, it depends on what aspect you're looking at. I would say, I don't know. It makes me think of Donald Judd's furniture. Like Judd was kind of the classic minimalist artist in the 60s in, in New York. And when he moved to Marfa, Texas, he started making his own furniture. And that was from these very plain, pre-cut chunks of wood. And he just made the most severely geometric chairs and tables and whatever. And in one way, they're very utilitarian in that they are simple to make. It's a simple design. And they fulfill their function perfectly. Like, it's a chair, it's a table. But they're horrifically uncomfortable. So it's like, sure, you can sit in it. It's like a 90-degree plywood chair, but you might not want to sit on it for too long. Like, it's not, it's not fulfilling the function of comfort, but it is fulfilling the function of a thing to sit on. Yeah, I was going to ask for the, the <laughs> comfort. Well, it's the same. His chairs sound a little bit the same as my shower, which is pseudo utilitarian. It looks like you've boiled it down to its function, but you've forgotten what the actual thing is for. Yeah, like pseudo utilitarian, I think is a great way to describe the consequences of this minimalist aesthetic. Like things that look like they should fulfill their function, but actually don't. I feel like I have taken you in directions so far that emphasize criticism of various aspects of the minimalist aesthetic, and we've talked about ways in which it can be fraudulent. I will say, however, that your your book is uh, very much not the case against minimalism. Uh, in <laughs> fact, uh, reading it, I developed an appreciation for some things that I didn't appreciate going into it. <laughs> Rock gardens, the paintings of Agnes Martin, <laughs> which I started to look at, and you realize that there are many ways in which this simplifying instinct can take us towards uh, an appreciation of things that we would overlook if they were just cluttered together with other things. <laughs> That's very nice. That was kind of the point of the book, I think, was to draw people away from this aesthetic of minimalism and hopefully bring us back to some of these artistic principles, which I think the fundamental principle of minimalist art was that you can find beauty in kind of any sensory perception, especially if you focus on it enough and like allow yourself to just perceive something. So an Agnes Martin painting that's just a grid of painted lines kind of confront you with your own ability to perceive things, even though it's so simple and there's not that much to perceive. It's a very fundamental idea that Agnes Martin is putting in front of you. Or similarly, like a John Cage musical composition, like the classic 433, is John Cage saying, the piano doesn't have to create the music. The sound that you can enjoy is all around you. You should focus on perceiving whatever there is to perceive. Like, you don't need the artist to make something dramatically beautiful and perfect for you. You can just perceive what you perceive, and that's great. So in that way, I think it's a very democratic or, like, accessible idea of art, because you can find art in whatever you want to, really. I've never found myself grinding my teeth at the idea of John Cage's 433, but I will say that I don't <laughs> think many people put it into their Spotify playlists. 
No, I think it works best as a conceptual joke. And I mean, I think John Cage, like minimalism and humor are not like paradoxical. <laughs> like they don't, I think they can both coexist. Like I find a lot of John Cage's work very, very funny. 433 is kind of a grand joke at the idea of art. And some of his chance-based compositions are just noisy like they're chaotic not pleasurable noisy sounds that he was kind of like fuck you listen to this (laughs) and i find that very funny like it's a way of joking and a way of making fun of art as much as anything and i always enjoy that like seeing the joke in it is part of the fun i think now we've started to look back in time and one of the things that you emphasize in your book is that This longing for less, this feeling that we would be better off living the simple life, certainly did not begin when Marie Kondo came over from Japan and asked us if our tchotchkes sparked joy. It has a (laughs) long history. So I'll ask you, what's the earliest kind of uh, articulation of this feeling, this longing that you found? Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I think... You can go back to kind of ancient Greek Roman philosophy and talk about the Stoics and the acceptance of what's around you and the acceptance of your fate in a certain way. And that feels minimalist to me. One of my favorite examples, I thought a lot about the Chinese I Ching, which is kind of this fortune telling system that was made up of these very plain grids and lines that represented the fractures on burnt tortoise shells as a way of predicting fate. And that kind of felt minimalist and certainly inspired future forms of minimalism. But then I think you can kind of track paths through Christianity, like Francis of Assisi and American transcendentalists like Thoreau. And Jesus, you have a quote here. Jesus (laughs) is the original minimalist. Yeah, I didn't. I don't know if I agree with that one, but that was a Christian blogger, minimalist lifestyle blogger, who called Jesus the original minimalist. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't know what his fashion sense was like or how he decorated his house. Certainly, he seemed to live a very simple life. <laughs> but yeah, I think the philosophy has a long history, I and mean, just the idea that civilization is too much, like consumerism is too much we're too obsessed with the material gain that's just kind of a perennial human theme and probably will recur as long as humanity exists yeah yeah of course uh, you cite thoreau thoreau go i need to simplify i need to purge i mean i still want my sister to do my laundry or whatever but i want to <laughs> you know that desire to what if i just had four walls a chair, a bed, <laughs> and my thoughts. Yeah, like things you make yourself. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to produce everything around me and simplify my life down to things I can control and manage. And I will be the heroic protagonist of Western civilization. Like, I think in some, you know, philosophically minimalist, but also egotistically maximalist, maybe. There is this sense that you've uh, you got out just there where about authenticity. There's this implicit idea often that the world around us, the society that we're in, has a certain something has been built atop the authentic, true human self, the essence of existence, and we have to strip away the inauthentic to reach the authentic. Yeah. I mean, authenticity is a thing that we're always pursuing, I think, even though we don't know what it means. It's like things feel inauthentic when they're too much or too abstract or too distant from their sources, maybe. So I think, I mean, in the 2010s, you could say that the internet caused a lot of people to feel inauthentic, to feel like, oh, the too much of my experience is online. It's too immaterial. It's too abstract from me. And that could cause a certain desire for minimalism, which is physical simplicity and like things you can understand and touch. As I say, you know, the longing for less, I totally grasp it. I think we can all kind of get this feeling. I worry that, uh, oh no, this is going to sound conspiratorial if I say that we are going to be told that, oh, you don't need to own a house. You don't need to, you can live in a bunk bed with uh, six other yeah. people and spend $3,000 a month on it. And you'll be living your true authentic life because you won't be surrounded by all of these material things you just don't need. 
I think that's true, though. <laughs> and I mean, it looked like it was going to happen, certainly in the late 2010s with WeWork and like We Live. That's kind of bigger than minimalist minimalist thing, gun. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's the scalable, like, efficient vision of authentic life that depended on its meaning for, like, depended on the city for its meaning. Like, there was no meaning to your dwelling. It was all about what you were doing out on the street or something. But again, I think the pandemic, like, totally proved the lie to that stuff. That, oh, all of a sudden you're trapped in your we live dormitory and you have nothing but minimalist furniture and like your weird cafeteria to survive on. Uh, and that didn't work out for many people. So I think there has been this retreat away from that idea and hopefully more people directly involved in their own life or something. Like I don't, I don't see it as homesteading quite, but I do think the pandemic caused a a big flight out of cities and a, a greater interest in rural lands and growing your own food and making your own stuff, uh, which can be good. You associate some of the uh, minimalist instinct of our own time or the time immediately before our own time, if we say that things have changed a little bit over the past few years, with anxiety and crisis. I want to read a quote from you here. You say, minimalism is a communal invention in the blank slate that it offers an illusion, especially given its history. It is popular around the world, I think, because It reacts against a condition that is now everywhere, a state of social crisis mixed with a terminal dissatisfaction with the material culture around us that seems to have delivered us to this point. Though the fault is our own, when I see the austere kitchens, bare shelves and elegant cement walls, the dim, vague colors and the skeletal furniture, the monochrome devices. Sorry, I really like your writing, so I just want to read a few of it. It's so vivid. I like this the, dramatic reading of the it. The white t-shirts, the empty walls, the wide open windows looking out onto nothing in particular. When I see minimalism as a meme on Instagram, as a self-help book commandment, as an encouragement to get rid of as much as possible in the name of imminently buying more, I see both an anxiety of nothingness and a desire to capitulate to it. Like the French phrase for the subconscious flash of desire to jump off a ledge, la pelle du vide, the call of the void. (laughs) (laughs) I do think, I remember writing that and it really (laughs) was kind of the climax of the book. Like it comes toward the end. And I think by meditating on this stuff for so long, I was very much in that mindset of like, oh, maybe we should just embrace nothingness. Maybe this is the answer. But I think, you know, it's paradoxical. It is this eternal longing that we have to, to throw it all away and embrace the void. I think I came to the conclusion by writing the book that like what you have to find that for yourself. Like you don't buy a t-shirt or a lamp or a chair or you don't paint your apartment walls white. Like that is not how you indulge in that desire for the void or that's not how you resolve it in yourself. Like you have to actually go back to your own sensations. You have to understand what your own perception of beauty is what your own like reality around you is. So I think the aesthetic of minimalism is often a distraction from that. I always think back to this insane photo shoot that I think the times did uh, of this woman's house, which was just a complete white void. Like the floors were painted white, the walls were white, the furniture was white. And it just seemed like no human being could exist in this space. And yet it was being upheld as the height of luxury and perfection. And I just, I feel like that totally speaks to the absurdity of that moment that like the most money in the world bought you a white vacuum. Well, I know this is one of the problems that I have is that when I'm in spaces that are made in accordance with a minimal aesthetic, I feel like as a human being, I'm a problem. I'm like killing the perfection (laughs) of the space with my stenches and my hairiness and my, you know, my non, (laughs) I am not a perfect, I am not a machine. I don't belong here. I am ruining it. (laughs) You're ruining the vibe of this minimalist room. Yeah. It's not livable. It's not a livable aesthetic and it's very hard to find yourself in those spaces. I mean, there is the Philip Johnson quote that I have in the book. Philip Johnson being the architect of the glass house, uh, a semi-famous, semi-reformed Nazi and the modernist tastemaker of America said, you can be comfortable in any space that's beautiful. And I think that's actually not 
super true. <laughs> <laughs> or it's, well, you went to the glass house and you saw yes. that it was beautiful and also unlivable. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I mean, the glass house, which is this small glass box with a tiny bedroom area and a little kitchen and one beautiful 18th century French painting, like that was not livable. It was always a facade. It was always an image. And Philip Johnson built these other buildings on that campus in order to actually sustain his Mm. life. (laughs) Like an enclosed bedroom with only one small window, a beautiful library slash studio, a weird neoclassical pavilion on a pond. Like that perfect modernist image was not ultimately sustainable for living a life. Actually, I got a Kyle Jacob quote to read you on that very subject. Minimalism can be oppressive. The style can make you feel like you don't belong in a space unless you conform to it, as in upscale cafes or severe hotel lobbies. Being in the glass house, among the handful of high design, high art objects that Johnson designed, uh, deigned to allow, doesn't really feel like freedom. But entrapment in someone else's vision, its spareness might seem luxurious, but it's also expensive and finicky, a facade of simplicity. <laughs> There we go. I repeat my own words, yeah. the facade. But it is finicky. It's like, if you have to have everything be in its perfect spot, if you have to immaculately compose your living space, then that's not flexible. That's not human. That's not very functional. And I always thought it was amusing to compare that to Donald Judd's home spaces in Marfa or in Soho, which were cluttered. Like he was the ultimate minimalist artist. And yet he kept piles of books on every single surface (laughs) that he (laughs) resided in. And he would have little seashells and sculptures and odds and ends and materials everywhere. And that was totally anathema to Johnson for sure. Did he sit in his own chairs? Yeah, he did. I think there's a good quote of his writing in which he's like, in a chair, you're supposed to be uncomfortable. Like, it should keep what you awake, hell? essentially. So he was like, when you're working, you can sit in a chair. When you're hanging out, you can go sit, you can, like, lay in a day bed that I also have. <laughs> okay. So the day beds are for, are for contemplating, and the chairs are for active working. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I just suspect that he was in the day bed more and his guests were in the <laughs> chairs more. I conclude here, Kyle Jacob, by asking you, because I think you do a fairly good job in the book of kind of withholding a little bit of your personal judgment, how your own relationship to minimalism ended up. I was trying to just judge from what you're wearing and what I see behind (laughs) you, whether you are in fact a minimalist or not, and I still can't tell. Yeah, I I mean, I still am a minimalist, I think. I think writing the book and and thinking through these aesthetics so deeply, I was, like, more appreciative of this more fundamental message, which is that you should engage with what's around you. You should know what's your taste. You should understand your own taste and appreciate the things you appreciate rather than just, like, kind of mindlessly accepting one style or another. So I would like to think that everything that's in the apartment or you know, our house is something that we understand and appreciate. I think we do kind of write books to exercise certain thoughts from our minds or get over a subject. And I think I kind of am happy that I've said everything about minimalism that I feel like saying. And now <laughs> I can... Well, sorry to make you say it again. <laughs> no, it's, you know, I've, I love that I had all these thoughts <laughs> already. And so... I feel like I fully digested this, and now mm. I can kind of mm. live my life beyond That's it. Funny. <laughs> that was my my last book on on right wing arguments was very much like this. I was like, I just need to write my definitive responses to all these arguments, so I never have to think about them again. Exactly, it's the <laughs> intrusive thoughts that you have to then spend two yeah. years obsessing mm. over, and then they're gone. <laughs> well, I will say that this book did make me really want a rock garden. I really want to like a beautiful rock, rock gardens garden. are beautiful. I would love one in my house. I think my girlfriend would not really appreciate it, but and it would be really heavy. I always wondered if it would break the floor or something. Oh, okay, so yeah, rocks, rocks, big, are, rocks. Yeah, big rocks. It's a lot of rocks for an apartment, but they are very beautiful. Well, if our listeners want to be uh, inspired to put a rock garden in their apartment, they should pick up the book, (laughs) The Longing for Less, Living with Minimalism. It is a totally fascinating tour of a desire for simplicity across the ages. 
Realm of the Stoics to Marie Kondo. And I would say that it does peel back the commodified husk of minimalism <laughs> to reveal something surprising and thoroughly alive. Kyle Checker, thank you so much for joining us at Card Event. Thanks for discussing it with me. The Current Affairs Podcast is a product of Current Affairs Magazine. If you are not subscribed to Current Affairs Magazine, visit currentaffairs.org slash subscribe today and get our glorious print edition. The Current Affairs Podcast is released regularly every week on patreon.com slash current affairs. Thanks for listening.